Hi, my name is Christine O'Reilly. I'm the Foraging Grazing Specialist with Omafra. And my talk today is about the biggest threat to your homegrown feed supply, both in 2023 and in the years ahead. Corn rootworm is a major pest. It's been nicknamed the billion dollar beetle because of the huge economic impact it has on the corn crop in North America every year. Larvae hatch in the soil in about June and they start to feed on corn roots. This feeding damage, like what you see on your screen, really limits the corn plant's ability to take up water and nutrients, and that has a direct effect on yield. For every root node that gets eaten by corn rootworm larvae, we estimate that we lose between 15 and 18 percent of a grain corn yield. In addition to reducing the yield of the corn crop, the damage caused by corn rootworm larvae also makes the plant very unstable. The corn no longer has the roots it needs to anchor itself properly. So when the crop tips and then grows straight up to rebalance itself and reach for the light, agronomists call this goosenecking because the shape of the plant is now bent and it looks a bit like um, the neck on a goose. So goosenecking is a very classic sign of corn rootworm damage. Sometimes corn plants that have had extensive corn rootworm feeding won't gooseneck, but a thunderstorm or strong winds will cause lodging and knock the, the crop over. Obviously, this is not ideal in grain corn or high moisture corn, but lodging can ruin a silage corn crop because trying to pick up this crop increases soil contamination and the risks of clostridial silage, butyric silage, um, and a whole big mess when it comes time to feeding out. For the past 16 years, growers in Ontario have relied on corn hybrids with BT traits, uh, sometimes industry calls this below ground protection, to grow continuous corn. Those BT traits work against corn rootworm like an insecticide, but in, in a slightly different way. However, just like dewormer resistance or herbicide resistance, this BT trait package is failing. There are areas in Ontario where the rootworms are not affected by BT anymore, and there's no new technology in development against this pest. This is a map showing a trapping network for adult corn rootworm beetles that was deployed in August of 2022. And any of the sites that have yellow, orange, or red circles are locations where there were an, so many adult beetles that our entomologists believe that those areas are at moderate, high, or extremely high risk of having BT-resistant populations um, simply because the number of corn rootworms is so high. One thing to keep in mind about this map is that it doesn't paint the full picture, and that's in part because there's just fewer traps east of the GTA, but I think it does really make a strong case for the fact that this resistance problem is not limited to a specific geography. We see high risk areas in any county where we grow a lot of continuous corn. And specific to the dairy sector, 14 of our top 15 dairy counties are moderate, high, or extremely high risk. So this is an issue that definitely will be affecting your feed supply, if not this year, in the next three to five. The hard truth on this issue is that only you care about your feed supply. If I've learned anything in the last two years working on this issue, it's that nobody in agribusiness has a good enough financial reason to step up and fix this. The corn sector has looked at the total number of corn acres they sell seed for and the proportion of that that is in continuous corn. And they've decided, you know, it's, it's a small amount 
and it's only grown for livestock feed. So this, this is a feed issue. They're not going to touch it. At the same time, your nutritionists and your feed reps have looked at this issue and went, that's, that's really about hybrid selection and crop management. That's not, that's not really what we do. So they don't want to touch it either. And at the end of the day, you are the person who has to walk into that barn and look at all those pairs of big brown eyes and say, I'm sorry, I don't have enough feed for you because the corn crop failed. So your advisors will not fix this for you, but if you ask them to help you, it is their job and they can, they can and they will help you come up with a plan to manage corn rootworm before it takes out your corn crop. So you are the only one who gets hurt if your corn crop fails. So you need to be proactive in getting the answers you need and a plan in place to manage this pest. So now that you understand how serious this pest can be in terms of affecting your homegrown feed supply, what can you do about it? So corn rootworm larvae need corn roots. That's their preferred feed source. If there's no corn in a field, the larvae starve to death. We can use that. And this is why crop rotation is the most effective and least expensive way to manage corn rootworm. If we get a crop rotation in place where we have some years out of corn in a crop that corn rootworm can't eat, the population crashes. So what kinds of crops make for a good rotation? Well, first of all, dicots are not hosts. So dicots are any of your crops that when they emerge out of the ground, they've got two little leaves. So it's things like legumes, so alfalfa, soybeans, um, brassicas are dicots, beets are dicots. These are types of plants that their root structure makes it so corn rootworm larvae can't eat them. There are some types of grasses that corn rootworm cannot survive on either. So sorghum sedan grass is one, any of your sorghums, corn rootworm can't eat those roots. Um, also our winter cereals, because they're very mature at the time those larvae are hatching, tiny baby larvae can't eat those mature winter cereal roots. So winter cereals are also not a host. Some grass species are an alternate host to corn, and that means some larvae will survive eating roots of those other grass species. So we do have to be a bit careful planning crop rotations, but in general, legumes, brassicas, sorghums, and winter cereals are all ways that we can break up that life cycle by starving those larvae. As a dairy farmer, by far the easiest corn rootworm management crop rotation you can implement on your farm is rotating corn with alfalfa. So alfalfa is not a host crop. Rootworm can't eat its roots. That alfalfa will stay in the ground for between nine and 12 cuts. That's a change from how we used to talk about it, where we would talk about alfalfa being in the ground for however many years. The recommendation is now based on lifetime cuts. So nine to 12 cuts for that alfalfa stand. Then you rotate back into corn. Make sure you choose a hybrid that does not have those below ground BT traits against rootworm. And that corn can be in the field for one to two years. An extra benefit of this rotation is you've got a nitrogen credit to your corn after alfalfa. And probably most importantly, you've got the same cost per acre or cost per ton as normal. It might take a bit more planning than what you usually do if you had a continuous corn field, but your, your feed costs remain the same, and that's a big one. Sometimes people are concerned with a tight alfalfa rotation because of the cost and effort involved in establishing the crop. And I want to reassure you that a tight rotation sometimes can keep costs down, provided that the management is in place to keep yield potential high. With our forage crops, the cost per acre to grow them changes very little because our equipment costs hardly change between a high yielding crop and a low yielding crop. 
Um, the change in inputs on this slide is due to the crop removal value of fertilizer. So we're just replacing what the crop takes out. And you can see that as that yield potential changes, the cost per ton climbs very quickly. So by keeping to that nine to 12 lifetime cuts and making sure our crops got good fertility and we take good care of it in terms of pests and diseases, we can keep our yield potential high and our cost per ton low. And that is where this, this tight corn alfalfa rotation can not only help manage rootworm, but can also help manage overall feed costs on the farm. Some of you may still be thinking, okay, Christine, I can't rotate my corn with alfalfa. That's not gonna work for my farm. If that's the case, your next best option is to trade acres with a grain farming neighbor. Um, so your corn goes in after their wheat, uh, pick a hybrid that does not have that below ground BT trait package, and then their soybeans follow your corn. And that way we've got that, that good rotation that breaks up the rootworm life cycle. The advantage for you is that it has minimal impact on your feed costs, cost per acre and cost per ton, because it's, it's a neighbor, it's still close by. And because I'm tight on time, I would just encourage you to look at Mark Brock's 2019 Nuffield Scholar Project called Farmer to Farmer Collaborations. Um, there's two links on the slide. The top one is to his written report that you can download and read. The bottom is to a webinar where he summarized what he learned. And um, he has some great insights into what makes a successful partnership. So if that interests you, I encourage you to look into the results of his project. Although this is less likely on dairy farms, we know some operations rely entirely on corn or have a large proportion of corn acres where a good rotation isn't possible. So a corn heavy option exists, um, but transitioning into that manageable rotation is very important that it's done right. So in the first year, you take a quarter of those corn acres and put them into a non-host crop. And I'll talk in a moment about what some of those options might be. In the second year, you put a different quarter of the acres into that non-host crop, and your first year corn can be planted to a hybrid that does not have that below ground BT trait package. Year three, again, you've got a different quarter of those acres that are out of corn, You've got first year corn with no BT trait package, and you have second year corn with no below ground BT trait package. By the fourth year, we've got our manageable corn rotation happening on the farm. So a quarter of the acres are not in corn in a non-host crop. We have a quarter that are first year corn, a quarter that are second year corn, and a quarter that are third year corn. And it's only that third year corn that will have a BT rootworm trait package, that below ground protection, because that is the highest risk for having um, really challenging population levels because they've been building for three years. So what non-host crops are options for that quarter of your acres in that, that corn heavy rotation? The first option is a double crop of a winter cereal, like fall rye or winter triticale, and a sorghum species, probably sorghum sedan grass, but could be sedan grass or forage sorghum. And when I compared a normal corn silage crop to this double crop option in the milk 2006 calculator, um, it predicted that a farm would lose just shy of $4,000 an acre based on current milk prices because of the lack of starch in this double crop. So while it's a great rootworm management option, um, we do need to make up that difference in energy in the ration. And again, Milk 2006 is predicting it would be about two and a half tons of cracked grain corn per acre. So you can see this is not a cheap option uh, to manage rootworm. But if you can't get a better rotation in place, maybe this could work. Another non-host crop option that's a little out of left field is sugar beets. They have comparable energy and, and close to the same yield that silage corn can have. Uh, the, the main challenge is that they need specialized equipment to harvest them, and that can be hard to find in Ontario. Um, but when we swapped homegrown corn, 
corn silage, and high moisture out of a beef finishing ration, average daily gain remained at three pounds per head per day. And the cost scenarios that we ran, assuming you could get the equipment, was very comparable to the double crop plus the purchased corn that that option would need. So um, it is something that could provide the, the yield and energy required to make up some of that gap in a dairy ration. Remember how I said that you, the farmer, are going to have to be proactive on this issue. Um, I encourage you this winter to get a meeting together with your nutritionist or feed rep and your agronomist or crop input supplier and have them at the same meeting, whether that's a virtual meeting or around the kitchen table, so that they can hear each other's point of view, they have different areas of expertise, and that the three of you can come up with a good plan that makes sure you're managing, a, you're managing corn rootworm so it can't destroy your corn crop, and you're also getting the feed quality and yield from all of the crops you're growing um, to, meet, to meet the needs for your ration and to make sure that um, you know, you're managing those feed costs and, and you've got good agronomy in the mix as well. I'm going to say this once more for the people in the back. Only you care about your feed supply. So you need to be proactive about starting these conversations because nobody else will. On a dairy farm, alfalfa and corn is the best rotation option to manage corn rootworm. There are other rotation options out there, but they're harder or more expensive to implement. And you can use your farm advisors and you should use your farm advisors to help create a plan. Just don't expect them to step up and fix this for you. You have to initiate that conversation to get the ball rolling and come up with management options before you have a problem with your corn crop. With that, um, my contact information is up on the screen if you want more information about this topic. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to Grey Bruce Farmers Week's Dairy Day, and uh, best of luck with your forage crops in the new year.